as far as muscle physiology, we describe the anatomy. That's where we left off before exam three. We describe the anatomy in uh, a, a good amount of detail. We even talked about the histological staining patterns that we saw. And so as we move on to speak about the actual mechanism of muscle contraction, um, it's gonna be important for you to recall that anatomy, for you to recall the different staining patterns, um, such as the I band and the A band, as well as uh, be able to recall um, the overall anatomy of the myofibril and those two overlapping filaments. <clears throat> so muscle contraction is basically the shortening of the sarcomere. And because that is the most, uh, the, the most microscopic unit of muscle, if the sarcomere shortens, that'll bring about shortening of the myofibril, shortening of the muscle fiber itself, right? That cellular unit, as well as the entire muscle body. Um, and this happens as the thick and, fil thick and thin filaments drag one another, right? Specifically the thick dragging the thin towards the center of the sarcomere. So early physiologists used to think that there was actual contraction of the filaments themselves. Um, and as we looked at this further with the development of the microscope and as we began to understand muscle a little bit better, what we realized is that neither of those filaments actually shorten themselves. What's happening is that the thick filament is dragging the thin filament. And that is what we call the sliding filament model. This um, theory of muscle physiology, which suggests that the thick filament latches onto the thin filament and drags it closer to the uh, M lines, which are the center of the sarcomere. And that is what brings about the shortening of this enti entire thing and the shortening of muscle altogether. Okay, um, so as I mentioned here, we're only gonna speak about cross bridge cycling, which is exactly how that force is generated and then excitation contraction coupling, how we can regulate, basically turn on and turn off muscle contraction. We will not speak about muscle metabolism. So here's what the histological staining pattern um, looks like in terms of the sliding filament model. What we see is that as the muscle contracts, the A band stays the same length. Okay, that's uh, an important distinction because it's the only um, band, it's the only histological staining region that remains the same in length as the muscle shortens. And that is because the a band is the area of overlap. So as we can see, the area of overlap remains the same because both filaments are sliding in opposite directions, right? Really important to point that out. So the A band here, as muscle is relaxed, we can see it's the same width as the A band down here when the muscle is contracted. So because this is sliding, the thick filament is sliding to the outer periphery of the sarcomere, and because the thin filament in blue is being dragged to the inner periphery, not the inner periphery, but the center of the sarcomere, then that area of overlap essentially stays the same. The I band shortens, right? Because again, we're dragging the thin filaments towards the center. So the I bands uh, are gonna be shorter, as we can see here. The H zone shortens, right? We're dragging the thin filaments towards the middle of the sarcomere. And the H zone is the center of the sarcomere, which is represented by only thick filaments. So that region becomes much smaller as the thin filaments slide towards the center. And the entire sarcomere shortens, excepting for the A band, okay? Now this is brought about due to the cyclical formation and breaking of cross bridge cycles. And cross bridge cycles are the interaction between the thick filament, specifically the heads of these myosin filaments that are sticking up, and the thin filaments. Um, and that interaction forms a cross bridge cycle. And that is um, made and broken over and over again in a cyclical pattern until the entire sarcomere shortens. Okay. And that will make a little bit more sense as we um, describe it a little better here. So here's an actual uh, photo micrograph showing those staining patterns um, and showing it in a relaxed piece of muscle up here and then a contracted piece of muscle down here. So once again, we see the I bands, which are these lighter staining regions becoming much shorter as the actin filaments 
drag towards the center. We see the H zone also becoming much smaller right in the middle. But the A band, which is a sort of moderately stained region becomes or stays the same rather, right? The A band remains the exact same in the relaxed form and in the contracted form. All right, let's get into the details of how these cross bridges are actually formed and broken and how we get this cyclical process um, that generates muscle contraction. So we have this link between actin and myosin, right, where actin um, is dragged towards the center of the sarcomere. And that happens because of the myosin head, which is reaching up and grabbing on. Now the myosin head is gonna undergo a conformational change. Um, it's gonna have two states, a high energy form. This is when it has ADP and an inorganic phosphate bound to it, right? Remember we talked about the two sites on that myosin head, one for binding actin, one for binding ADP. Um, and so when it has ADP and, and uh, that phosphate bound to it, it's in its high energy form, and it now has a higher affinity for actin. So it's gonna be really attracted to actin, it's gonna to wanna to bind, make a contact, and that is how we form that cross bridge cycling. Now in its low energy state, this is when it has ATP bound to it. So not in the hydrolyzed state, we just got ATP bound, and this is when it has a lower affinity for actin, and it's going to want to uh, lose contact or break away from actin, um, and that is what is going to break that cross bridge cycle. So we got to understand here that myosin is going to have a state where it's really attracted to actin, it's going to reach up and grab onto actin, um, and then it's going to have a low energy state where it's not attracted, it's going to let go of that bond. And that keeps happening over and over again, right, making and breaking that contact. And that is what is essentially dragging the actin closer towards the center of the sarcomere. So this relies on the hydrolysis of ATP in order to liberate energy to actually drive this process. The hydrolysis of that ATP, which gives us that inorganic phosphate, that phosphate is holding the energy that is eventually going to do the dragging of the actin towards the amine. Right? Okay, now one way to kind of um, make an analogy that kind of makes this make sense is thinking about rowing a boat on water. So we're gonna compare an oar paddle, right? If you think about an oar paddle that you would dip into the water and row right, moving some water behind you as you propel the boat forward, um, we, can kind of we can kind of think of cross bridge cycling in a similar fashion. Like the oar paddle is what's making contact and breaking contact. And we can think about the thick and thin filament as when the oar, the oar paddle contacts the water, right? That is the breaking and making of that, that cross bridge. And so in that analogy, we can speak about the power stroke. So the power stroke is when the myosin head drags the actin um, towards the M line, and that is what propels the, uh, the entire sarcomere to shorten, right? Um, and so that is what, in our analogy, is what's going to move the boat forward. But in the, in the um, instance of muscle, this is what is bringing the actin filament closer to the M line um, and shortening the entire sarcomere. So when the thick and thin filaments detach, that is when the ore breaks contact and we can move our ore to a new position in order to drag more water behind us. Similarly, we're gonna move the myosin head to a new position on actin to drag that thin filament even closer towards the M line. Okay, and so the myosin head is going to reposition itself to a new spot to bring that acting closer. I hope that analogy kind of makes sense. It's one that usually um, kind of gives you an idea of what this looks like um, as we speak about these microscopic structures in a real way, right? So we've got this myosin head reaching up, grabbing onto actin, dragging it close to the M line. It's going to reposition itself grab another bit and drag it closer again. And that happens over and over again until the, the sarcomere is completely shortened or the muscle is completely contracted. Okay. Um, and so we can look at this schematic as representing the, the steps in that process. So let's go through these steps one by one. 
as we speak about how cross bridge cycling is actually brought about. So to start, um, let's remind ourselves of the structure of these filamentous proteins, right? We've got actin here in blue, and actin is nothing but these different monomers that are strung together, um, like pearls on a string, we, we describe them. And then we've also got myosin, and myosin has these heads that are sticking up that have the two binding spots, one binding spot for that, phos that um, ADP and that phosphate, and the other binding site for actin, right? Um, whereas on our thin filament, we have the binding spot for myosin, which are these black dots. We've got this regulatory protein, troponin, and this other protein, tropomyosin. And so these two proteins are going to be important in the regulation of this process. But for now, we're really going to focus on looking at where myosin makes contact with actin. Okay. So we start off with uh, myosin in its high energy state. Remember we said when it has ADP and that inorganic phosphate bound to it, it's in a state where it's really attracted to actin. And so as we can see here, it's made contact with actin um, because it's in that high energy form. Subsequently, the phosphate is released off, right? We release that inorganic phosphate off and that is what liberates the energy to complete the next step, which is the power stroke. So the power stroke is the actual dragging of that actin filament closer towards the center of the sarcomere or towards the, uh, the M line, right? So the phosphate that is released off liberates the energy to drag actin towards the M line, and we call this second step the power stroke. Now the ADP is released off. So after the ADP comes off, now uh, we still have actin bound to myosin. And the reason we still have actin bound to myosin is because we don't have ATP on there yet. We talked about this myosin head being in two states. The high energy state is when it has this ADP and this inorganic phosphate, but the low energy state is when it has ATP bound. And until we get a new ATP molecule here, this myosin head is gonna remain tightly bound to this actin filament, okay? And this is where we get the concept of rigor. So rigor is this state where myosin is still in its low energy form. Um, although we don't have a new ATP in here, we need uh, that ATP to come in in order for myosin to let go of actin. Um, and so this is what brings about rigor mortis. If you've ever heard of rigor mortis, which is the state where your muscles stay tightly contracted after death, um, and that is because in the absence of ATP, right, after you die, there's no ATP circulating, and so myosin stays tightly bound to actin, and essentially that muscle is going to stay tightly contracted in the state that it was in, and that's why even after death, um, a person remains or a cadaver remains in the exact same state that it was if rigor mortis is allowed to set in. And this is the physiologic explanation for that rigor mortis. Now the next step is a new ATP comes in and binds onto that myosin head. And that will now unbind myosin from actin. So a new ATP must come in so that that myosin head can go back into its low energy state where it is not attracted to actin and it's gonna let go of that actin filament, okay? And that is what breaks the contact of actin and myosin. Now that second ATP, that new ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP and inorganic phosphate once again, and that prepares myosin, the myosin head, to be in its high energy state once again, and it's gonna become attracted to actin and reach up and grab onto that actin. And that's where we describe the myosin head as being in its cocked state where it's ready to make contact with actin once again. And this process happens over and over and over again until that actin is brought to um, the center of the sarcomere and that is when the muscle is fully contracted, right? So it doesn't just happen once, but it's happening again and again and again and again until we have full contraction our full shortening of the sarcomere, okay? And so these are the five steps that are um, important for cross-bridge cycling. The binding of myosin to actin, 
the power stroke, which is the liberating of that inorganic phosphate and the dragging of actin. We've got rigor, which is the third step, that tight interaction between actin and myosin until a new ATP comes in. We've got the unbinding of myosin when that new ATP comes in. And then we've got the hydrolysis of that new ATP, which brings the myosin head back in its cocked position. All righty. Okay. Now um, I'm going to break and see if there are any questions about that. And in the meantime, while I kind of wait to see if there are any questions coming up, there's a really nice video that I've posted in Blackboard. Um, if you haven't looked at it already, um, I suggest that you kind of look at it after this. Um, and it's going to be a good way to summarize all of these steps um, in a 3D way that will make you appreciate them better. So have a look at this short video um, if you haven't already done so.